Hey everybody, welcome to episode number 110 of Toe in the Slab, Pitching with David Cohn. We talk pitching and we do it with the five-time World Series champ, the Cy Young Award winner David Cohn, the research ace James Smythe, and myself Justin Shackle. Our wonderful producer Dan Work is with us as well. David, James, you both have been uh, grinding for the last six months in the broadcast booth and I got a a week-long head start on my summer vacation, my baseball off-season. These are uh, your first few days of summer vacation. How are David Cohn and James Smythe celebrating now that school is out? <laughs> Watching more baseball, right? I mean, just when you think you're out for the year, a game like uh, last night just pulls you right back in. And, you know, it's a tremendous, tremendous playoff baseball going on. So how could you not cover it for the first six months and then not see what happens at the end, right? I mean, that's, that's kind of where we are. You know, I, I got to see how this whole thing finishes out this Major League Baseball season. It's a little jarring. You know, you go from, you know, zero to 100 uh, right out of the gate early in the year. And then you go zero, 100 to zero uh, from one day to the next. And it is a little uh, a little jarring. But, you know, now that now that we got the the season ended a little abruptly for us. You know, usually we're used to working Yankee playoff runs into October. but a little early ending this time, but still great to watch playoff baseball. Yeah, I would say in between going from zero to 100 and 100 to zero, we're like on a steady cruise control, probably like 75. So uh, it's it's a long marathon. It's awesome, obviously. But uh, yeah, I will admit, other than last week's podcast episode, I did absolutely nothing to forward my life uh, <laughs> after the Yankee season ended here, other than watch baseball and sit on my couch. And I uh, continue to do that here this week. And I would have to say, just like David mentioned, Monday night, as we get right into it here, let's start with the opener here. Game two of the National League Division Series, Phillies and Braves. Guys, I think I'm going to go out on a limb here and say game two of that series between Atlanta and Philadelphia will probably have been the most riveting game in October. I think that's a bold statement, or am I kind of in the right no, I mean, I think just the big finish. It was such an exciting finish at the end that 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 drew that kind of drew everybody in, and also the fact that the Atlanta Braves had a historic season this year. I mean, all the home runs they hit, all the runs they scored early in the game, their juggernaut of an offense. Their season was on the brink, and then without that comeback, and it just goes to show you that there's certain teams that are built for postseason. The Philadelphia Phillies are one of those teams because of their. Their dominant starting pitching, Wheeler was as good as it gets for six innings or so. They were in in control of that game, but what a big comeback to save the Brave season and get them right back in that series. That that's what brought you back is, you know, that it's you know another another first round knockout for maybe the best team in the sport. You now that they're right back in it now. Well, if it's not the most exciting two inning sequence of the postseason, I'd like to see what's on tap moving forward. But the Braves. Coney, you mentioned the home runs. This is a historically home run reliant offense. And they seemed a little a little slow out of the gate in game one, first half of game two. But when you can hit the ball out of the ballpark one through nine, that is the sign of a team that can do a quick strike anytime. So you can turn four nothing into five four in, a, in an inning, in a couple of innings. And a little shout out too to the Braves bullpen because they held the fort down when Max Fried departed after a less than stellar start. You had just an honor and run allowed. Kirby Yates, Joe Jimenez, Pierce Johnson, AJ Minter, Rysel Iglesias. Five innings of three hit ball with only an honor and run allowed. And they kind of held the Phillies at bay, giving their offense a chance to come back. And now the series is wide open. Yeah, we were only uh, like a handful of outs away from the narrative that teams with buys who you know won their division, established the best records in their respective leagues, that they were kind of at a disadvantage to start the division series. It's funny how the Braves come back really cooled off that narrative. So you have one team and one decision kind of flipping the script in that area. And that's kind of where I want to start, guys. So we all agreed last week that we'd rather have the – scenario where the team has the first round by get your pitching in order get some rest for some players who may be hurting with various injuries and i'm not going to ask if either of you feel different after the handful of games 
where the higher seed lost in the division series. I cannot buy into that at all at this moment. But I, I personally don't think that we should be trying new things here for the first time during the postseason. And if you look at it, the time off for the teams with buys was actually longer than the time that they had off at the All-Star break. So I wonder, is it too long of a layoff for teams that – had the two best records, won their divisions, and have that first round by. It's an interesting point. I mean, if you want to put the wild card teams at a, a greater disadvantage, you take away the the back the back end off day to, to shorten it maybe by one day potentially. Um, you know, I'll always say that I'll take the extra rest, and mainly because right now I believe that the best pitcher in the sport is Zach Wheeler. Just how dominant he's been. He's already pitched twice. So if you've got a long postseason run, how many bullets are left there? You know, I, I just speaking from experience, every round just grinds you down. It's already been a long season for him. Now he's already had two big postseason starts. Uh, he may pitch again in the series in game five. Who knows? That would be three before you even get to the LCS. So think about two in the LCS and two in the World Series. That's a it's another month over, you know, seven starts. Uh, that That's why I always will take the first round by. But you're right. Uh, th there's no doubt that high velocity is hard to simulate. You can do it off of pitching machines, but you can't do it in games that, you know, on off days at your home park while you're waiting and waiting a whole week to pit, to play a real game. So, yeah, maybe maybe you could tweak it. Maybe you could, as I said, take away that last off day uh, before. You know, if, if it goes three games in the first round, then Friday night, here we go. We're gonna we're gonna start. We're not gonna start on Saturday, but. A lot of business decisions involved in that, including television, and we we all know that because we we work for big networks. I think that it's really been a whole lot of fuss over not a lot because you had the off day between games one and two, which is a little unusual in the National League, which kind of left left all this time to have the takes simmer. And I think that a lot of the criticism of the format and it really it seemed like just complaining just seemed off base because if you look at the teams that had the buy last year, you, the rest argument would really be best talking about game one where the team had all this time off and then they come in and play. They went three and one in game one last year. And the loss was the Braves scoring six runs. And so the idea that, well, it would be the offenses that would be behind the eight ball there. Well, it didn't really seem to be the case. And the two teams, the, the four teams that got the buys last year went two and two. And the team that had the layoff that ended up winning the World Series and steamrolling through the postseason was the Houston Astros. So I don't see what the real problem is here where we have teams go three and one with the with the long layoff. And then this year, OK, the teams went one and three in game one. We'll see how these series shake out. There was a lot of hand wringing over one game that the Braves and Dodgers had lost. Now, the Dodgers lost. The Braves won. Now, and one, and one more thing about the layoff, because it's been this uh, probably the biggest narrative so far in, in the postseason. Dan Zimborski of Fangraphs broke down, broke it down, the history, looking at playoff series where it was a team with a four plus day layoff going against a team with a layoff of two days or fewer. Rest versus rust, right? And that happened 35 times. The rested team went 24 and 11 in their series, which is even better than would be expected considering the quality of the teams and the record going into the series. So 24 and 11, it doesn't seem like it's, it's a, a problem in need of a solution right now. I hear all the, the information that you just gave here. And, and I agree, I mostly agree with you, but I think you're going to have some people, some fans here say, well, James, what do you make of the Braves being shut out at home for the first time all season in game one? of the division series this year. And again, a, a very small example for this year's pie, but uh, I'm, I'm going to have to represent those fans here. So what would you, would this, you just talk it up the chance here? A little bit. I mean, the Phillies okay. pitch great. It's one thing when you run into, when the Dodgers run into Merrill Kelly and Zach Gallon. Okay. That happens. You run into a, a two, a, maybe the best one, two punch or one of the best one, two punches in the league. It is a little strange that a team as great as them get shut out by Ranger Suarez in a collection of, of Philly relievers and the, uh, the bullpen parade there, they pitch great. <laughs> you know? So I guess you just say that's baseball, Susan. Yeah. Look, Lar I, I feel like we need a whole, uh, a whole lot of additional evidence to start making uh, 
concrete opinions about how this format plays out. It, two years is definitely not enough, but we're, we're never going back to, Hey, the teams with the best records, they automatically go to the world series here. Like the wild card era is just going to c- continue to evolve. It's not going backwards here, but I do wonder with that evolution, are we moving further and further away from giving a certain amount of favor to the best teams over the 162. So like, will the playoff format guys, will it ever truly favor the best teams over the regular season? Yeah, that, that a utopian view, right? I mean, we all would like to see that, but it's, it's much harder to achieve uh, with all that being said, it kind of lends the lends to the argument of there's certain teams that are really great regular season teams. And there are certain teams that are built for postseason and, this year is a perfect example of that. The difference between the Braves and the Phillies because of the pitching at the top and the way the Phillies were able to rest their entire pitching staff. And really the top two starters, Nola and Wheeler were arrested the whole month of September because they had a wild card locked up. They didn't have to worry about a division title and the Braves were kind of playing against themselves to, through history till the, till the end of the year. But, but when you've got somebody that's on top of their game, like Wheeler and Nola are right now, at least how they've looked so far, uh, that that's to me that just kind of uh, it's more of the argument of personnel than it is you know rest or format or anything like that. The Braves have a juggernaut offense. We knew their starting rotation was going to be iffy coming in because Max Fried's injury and his blister and 18 days off, and of course Spencer Strider kind of in uncharted territory in terms of workload and his heavy strikeout uh, total throughout the regular season. This guy really worked hard the whole season. Now comes the really grind, grinding starts of the playoffs where every pitch matters. And you guys see that covering the games, or at least watching the games. I mean, the fans dictate the nature of the game, and it's a big game in postseason. And they're on their feet every time you get two strikes, every pitch, pitch to pitch. It just matters that much more, and it takes that much more out of you as a starting pitcher, as a pitcher in general. Well, now we're getting into a sort of a larger philosophical mm-hmm. argument here as far as the structure of the playoffs, right? Well, that's kind of been the case since 1969. You know, from 1968 and before, you take the best team in the American League and the best team in the National League, and boom, here's the World Series. If we did that now, it would just be Orioles-Braves, World Series. We'd probably be done by now. We'd be, we'd be recapping <laughs> a World Series, which I don't know if we'd want that. But playoffs in any sport, they don't contract. They only expand. And – if you want a little less chaos, you're going to have to stop inviting more and more teams. When you expand the playoffs more and more, you introduce more of this, this randomness yeah. as we get further and further into the playoffs. And it, it kind of is what, you know, what do you like? You know, it March madness, you know, people love the upsets, but you don't want too many because then your sweet 16 ends up being, you know, a nine seed, a 13 seed and a, a 14 seed but you still want some of the the big dogs in there. And when you talk about these hundred win teams, this has been happening for a long time. And especially since the division series started in 1995 and then the introduction of the wild card. Now there's all these extra rungs and extra teams. You're expanding a playoff field from eight to 10 to 12. They're talking about 14, 16 down the pike. So I think that, if you want to consider it a problem that they don't reward the best teams enough, that's not going to change because when you talk about three game series and five game series, even a seven game series, there's only so much certainty you could have. I think it's only going to be tougher to swallow. If you're a fan of a team who won a hundred plus games and they get bounced in this tournament style, because you're probably only expanding the field. Once expansion happens, once we go from 30 to 32 teams, like you're probably going to have what, eight teams in each league make the playoffs at at, at a certain point. So it's more of a tournament more than ever. And I I think we may have to come to grips here that more often than not, the the playoff format will serve more like a March madness scenario. And it's not so much who you play. It's when you play them, the best team over 162 games may not be properly represented. I just feel like it's, it's hard for a fan of a, but team, like, let's just say the Braves fall short here. I personally don't think they do. And maybe we shouldn't be going down this avenue with hypotheticals. But anyway, not to label a 100-win team in this scenario. It's going to be really tough for fans to take solace that their team over the course of 162 was the best team in Major League Baseball 
yet they don't have anything to raise up in the rafters because of it. You don't you don't win uh, a 162 game regular season and raise a banner because of that. That's going to be tough to take, I think, in the future as we continue to expand the field. Well, guys, like maybe that shows that maybe fans and baseball fans should maybe recalibrate some of our expectations. You know, and back in the old days, I mentioned that in those days when teams would vault right into the World Series, sometimes you'd have a it would be a bigger deal that a team won the pennant than if they won the World Series. They would have parades just for winning the pennant before the World Series because it's that dedication to the grind of the season and celebrating that. Not that we need to have a, a president's trophy of sorts like they have in hockey. And that's a bit of a curse over the years where the team with the best record for the regular season always ends up falling short of winning the Stanley Cup. But I, I think it's like an American sports thing where, you know, the regular season is meaningless, throw everything in the trash. And then if you don't win the tournament, you're an epic failure. And maybe it just we're playing two different sports. And, and that's been the case at, at least for as long as I've been a fan. Great points. You know, and, and also some people feel that, as far as competitive balance goes, if you're a comp- competitive balance person and you you you're a fan of a small market team, it gives you more of a chance to get into the dance. You know, there's there's more playoff spots if you're sitting in uh, even Arizona this year with their payroll. You know, sneaking in the end, I think they had a negative run differential you know, for the majority of the year. Maybe right till the the end, I believe they were they they gave up more runs than they scored this year. I believe the Arizona Diamondbacks, but they got hot at the end. They did, and they're they're an example of uh, the expanded format helping a smaller market keep you know as far as competitive balance goes, giving them a chance to get into the dance. If you're a fan of Milwaukee or Kansas City or you know one one of the smaller market teams, you know that that's what you can hang your hat on is you know at least we have a chance to sneak into the dance if we just stay at around eighty five to ninety wins or so. I, I think that's been the mark. The Phillies last year were eighty six wins and got all the way to the World Series, so. That, that's the most recent example, I think, that, that you can hang your hat on if you're a, a mid or small market team. The flip side of that, though, is that it creates this race to the middle where the bigger market teams, I'd say, well, why would we even bother trying to go from 94 wins to 98 wins or from 97 wins to 102 wins when we know we could win 100 games and go one in three against some 84 win team and then and then our season's over and it goes out the window. So it's it, there's kind of this push and pull do or don't. I'm not saying that there's a right way or a wrong way to think about it or to go about it, but it just creates this very uh, unusual um, way of thinking here. Yeah, that's yeah, the yeah. Phillies this year. That's the Phillies. It was uh, the end of August. Rob Thompson started talking about resting his starters. They did the six man rotation to rest Wheeler and Nola. And that was September 1st, you know, when they started implementing that. There was no guarantee they were getting in, although they had a pretty good lead. They kind of knew where they were slotting in, but you're right, uh, James, the, the Phillies kind of gamed the system this year going, Hey, the Bra- we're not going to catch the Braves. Let's rest our horses. Let's get ready. And it's work for them. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll see how Nola comes out in this next start, but the Phil- Phillies are poised, even with that, even with that blown game are poised to be in really good shape with their pitching because of the way they, they were able to rest them in September. All right, let's kind of gloss over each series one by one. And I know we touched on the Braves in the opener and, and game two of the division series there. I find it extremely ironic here. They, I mean, they lose the game started by Spencer Strider through no fault of him. And they win the game in which Zach Wheeler had a no hitter going. So uh, speaking of Braves, Phillies here, how do you assess where Atlanta's pitching staff is at through through two games? Kind of what we thought going in, right? There's going to be some rust. There's going to be some health issues. Um, you know, how could they hold up? Uh, yeah, Spencer Strider still a swing and miss guy. He's still a guy that any team would love to have start any game of any any series uh, against anybody. So that that's how good his stuff is. And you always go with stuff. Max Fried's a little concerning, though. I mean, his control was off. He normally really good control. I'm not sure of health wise where he's at, but we know that the long layoff left him a little bit rusty. So we'll see his next go round if they get there, if he gets another start or not, how how he fares. But yeah, I mean, we don't even do we know who's starting the next game for the Braves? I mean, that that shows you that shows you right there the state of the Braves rotation. We we have that uh, invisible guy right in in in, yeah. in, the, in the face of TBD. Of, yeah, of the <laughs> probable starters that, that yeah the TBP. To be announced, TBA. The most beautiful chiseled silhouette of a, a facial <laughs> yeah. structure one can have, yeah. That's the state of the Braves rotation right now. 
we know who's starting for the Phillies. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be Aaron Nola, who's ready to go, coming off a great first start, making his second postseason start, just like his counterpart, uh, you know, Rocket Wheeler. He was throwing Rockets, wasn't he? I mean, he might be the best pitcher in the game right now, Wheeler, on top of, on top of his game right now. Well, last week, Shaq, you posed the question, you know, what do you think of the of the Braves going into the playoffs, even without without Charlie Morton? Uh, he was definitely going to be out for the DS. He said, well, the way the format is in the NL with the extra off day, you only need three starters. If Strider, Strider, and if Freed is good to go, then you'll be fine. Now, they kind of went one for two there because Strider looked good. He got beat in game one. Game two, Freed was shaky. They end up eking out the win. Now this is the the swing game, right? That that one one in a game three, you're going to be on the road. And I guess, guys, is it going to come down to Bryce Elder or AJ Smith Shaver? Now Elder, he was a guy who was outperforming his peripherals in the first half of the year. He had a two nine seven ERA, and his fielding independent pitching was over four. And then that kind of swung back to earth a little bit after the All Star break, where the the FIP was up around five and that's right where his ERA was. His ERA was five eleven after the all-star break. AJ Smith Chauver, he's a little bit out of nowhere, a, a recent call up. And, you know, it might, it's probably a little silly to talk about these kinds of splits when we're talking about, you know, 40 plate appearances <laughs> for the guy in September, but first time through the order batters hit 150 and slugged 325. Second time through those numbers jumped up to a 265 batting average and a 706 slug. So is the thinking there say, Hey, if if Smith Shaver can get us one time through the order, maybe he can give us two, three innings. Maybe Elder can give us two, three innings, and we can kind of tread water. And then maybe it's it's a close game, or maybe you can eke out a lead against Nola, and maybe it's three, three in the fifth or sixth. And you say, okay, well we can take it from here. That you got to cross your fingers with that. It, either way, you still have Strider in Game Four and Freed in Game Five. Now, uh, Frenchie Francoeur, uh, Jeff Francoeur made a good point during the broadcast in game two about freed saying, Oh, he had all this, this, this layoff with the blister. Well, now he's going to be making a regularly scheduled start. If it comes around in game five, what is the recovery time like that? Coney? Yeah, no, he should be okay. I mean, uh, he, it wasn't as if he, you know, got really extended in his first start. He was knocked out after four innings. Um, didn't go well. Um, certainly high motivation to bounce back, have a good one. I think if you're Max Freed and your Braves, you're in the Braves, you're, you hope, you get to game five. You hope Max Fried can pitch again because you're going to Philadelphia. You got to face Aaron Nola, and you're looking for a split there any way you can to to, uh, to get your your game five and Max Fried pitching back in your home park, your home ballpark. More tone of the slab is coming up, people. I need to tell you about a special offer from DraftKings because the NFL season is officially here. We've partnered with DraftKings Sportsbook, an official partner of the National Football League to bring all new customers an exciting way to join in on the action right now. New customers, download the DraftKings app, use the promo code SLAB, S-L-A-B, bet just five bucks, and boom, $200 in bonus bets hit your account instantly. That's right, new customers who bet only $5 will get $200 in bonus bets Instantly, stay in on the action. Use your $200 in bonus bets on DraftKings parlays. Combine multiple bets together for a shot at an even bigger payout. If sports betting is not yet available in your state, don't worry. You can still get another fun with DraftKings Daily Fantasy, where they offer cash prize contests for nearly every sport. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now. New customers, use the promo code SLAB. Again, S-L-A-B. Bet just five bucks on any wager and get $200 in bonus bets instantly. That's promo code SLAB only at DraftKings Sportsbook. All right, over the course of the regular season, Max Fried was a frequent topic on this podcast. So was the, the Dodgers starting a rotation. And I guess much like the Braves running into the Phillies, obviously you have Nola going in game three. Wheeler already went, but the Dodgers ran right into Merrill Kelly and Zach Gallon in that order. They're down 0-2, going back to Arizona. D-backs need to win just one of the next three games here to pull off the division upset. But when we looked at all the problems and adversity the Dodgers starting rotation faced, I don't think we thought it was going to be as radical as Clayton Kershaw and Bobby Miller combining for just two innings over the first two games on the mound here. So we're it's, a, it's an interesting question because they – 
provided so little, but were we asking too much of this Dodgers pitching staff with all the adversity it went through? Valid points all the way around. I mean, we were worried about Kershaw for the better part of the second half of the season with injuries and is, is he going to have enough time? What can you really get out of him? Five and fly kind of a start. Um, you Nobody expected what we saw there in the first inning. It's just mind boggling that the very best left-handed starter since Sandy Koufax had another bad postseason start. It's just unbelievable to look at his career numbers and to see the pain he was in in that dugout was just, uh, to me, uh, startling. To, you know, as, as a guy I respect so much for his craft and how good he is. His regular season numbers are second to none. So, uh, yeah, no, I, I think we kind of saw this coming a little bit with the Dodgers. I mean, your, your first pitcher was, you know, is, on, uh, is in the twilight of his career. Your next starting pitcher is in the beginning of his career. So a little too old, a little too young in experience, a little too much experience. Um, yeah, no, that was what we thought with the Dodgers all the way along. The same thing, uh, same thing with the Braves. The two best teams in this tournament, two best teams, the best team in the National League, or the two best teams in the National League, really, you could say the Dodgers and, and the Braves, maybe the two best teams in the sport. Uh, we, we, we had this, we had this worry about them, about, about their pitching, about their starting pitching. Can it hold up? How are they going to line up? The Dodgers didn't know how they were going to line up really till almost the end. You know, I keep saying this, the Phillies had it lined up in August, at the end of August, they had their rotation figured out for postseason. They knew exactly what they were going to do. The Dodgers, not so much. Can Kershaw make it or not? Is Bobby Miller really going to be our number two guy? The Braves, same thing. If you look at the Braves, uh, Max Fried, is he going to be okay? Is he going to make it? Spencer Strider's throwing a lot of innings. His workload's really, really heavy for a young pitcher. So, yeah, no, we, we we saw this coming both ways. So it's really not that big of a surprise other than Kershaw really getting blown out of the water. You know, the, the adage of, you know, teams getting hot in October, we always look at it from that side of the coin. The other side, the other side is you could be catching a team at the wrong, you could be catching a team at the right time or the wrong time for them. And that might be it for the Dodgers. And, you know, I'm not going to put, too much a game two on the pitching staff, which sounds a little crazy because Bobby Miller put him in a three nothing hole pretty quick. And I know the offense was facing Zach Gallen, who is probably going to be a top five ish in the Cy Young voting in the National League this year. But all things considered, three nothing in the first inning shouldn't be too big a hole for the Dodgers offense to climb out of. And all things considered, the, the Dodgers held Arizona to four runs in game two, when you had such a big question mark with Bobby Miller, but credit to Bruce Dark Gratterall, Ryan Brazier, Joe Kelly, Evan Phillips, they kind of held, held the diamondbacks back. And if you went into the game saying, Hey, we're going to go into this game. We have no idea what we're going to get out of Bobby Miller and the bullpen and everything, but the diamondbacks will score four runs tonight. The Dodgers are probably thinking, Hey, we're going to come out of here with a split and they'll score, you know, their four or five runs and, 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 and pull out a win. And as far as uh, Kershaw goes, Coney, it is it is a shame to see how that all went down the other night. And at this point, uh, you know, Kershaw, he's throwing 88. His, his shoulders being held together with scotch tape and they're just trying to eke it out any way they can. And and the question marks are still going to be there. Now they're going to Arizona. Diamondbacks seemingly been on the road for a month and now they're going to be coming home. It's going to be crazy at Chase Field sn smelling a sweet. But the Dodgers are still built to to win this thing because they can take they, they're going to have an advantage in, in game three i think uh, you're not going to you're going to miss it's the one game that you're going to miss kelly or gallon out of the the potential five and if you can win that one maybe maybe you can crack the door open a little bit but it's going to be a tall order you know you know not for nothing guys i think um you know, watching Zach Gallon pitch, what a craftsman. That was just a pleasure to watch. Mixing all of his pitches, kind of back to the school of how, how you pitch, how you mix, how you sequence your pitches. We saw that with Garrett Cole down the stretch run, too. And he even admitted, I, I'm pitching more now, throwing more knuckle curves, change-ups, more of a four-pitch pitcher, more of a craftsman. How much more enjoyable that is to watch than the redundant style of a power pitcher, you know, uh, say even like a Carlos Rodon last year, just throwing all high fastballs, and all sliders down low. And then sort of that over and over redundant strategy to me just isn't as interesting to watch. Watching Zach Gallon work, boy, that guy, that guy really was doing some pitching, mixing all of his pitches, getting into the sixth inning. To me, that was just, just much more fun to watch. And Garrett Cole down the stretch, watching him pitch. 
that way as more of a pitcher and pitching more was just much more interesting to watch. In my opinion, I know I'm an old, you know, old fogey here and, you know, I, I mix it up and changed arm angles, but to me, that, that that's pitching. That's fun to watch. Creative spotting your pitches, sequencing your pitches, changing speeds. Beautiful. And, and yeah. the tunneling that gallon had going was phenomenal. You could, you could watch the highlights, check out pitching ninja. He did some great, um, yeah. overlay breakdowns of the, of the fastball and the breaking ball. And you talk about working all parts of the plate, all pitches up, down, in, out. Pablo Lopez was that guy the other night too. Yes. So we got, we got to throw him some love. And also I loved his interview in the dugout after his game with Tom Verducci. And that is, he put on a clinic on pitching. Pitching's making a comeback, Shaq. Two yep. seam, four seam, changing speeds, up, down, and out, front to back styles. I mean, why, why would you want to leave anything in your saddlebag if, you, if you've got the ability to, to use all those different styles of pitching to get hitters out? And really, the psychological warfare, too. You see a lot of hitters shaking their heads, going back to the dugouts, trying to figure out, hey, you threw me this. I was looking for that, you know, and just keeping hitters off balance. Tony, you are not alone, so don't worry about that. It's the art of the craft. And way, way, way uh, more people than you probably think probably appreciate that and what we're seeing here from these handful of pitchers. I'll, I'll stay on Pablo Lopez here and the Twins and the Astros because I really enjoyed the dialogue that you had in the broadcast booth with Adam Wainwright and A.J. Pruszynski talking about just pitching culture, some topics that we discussed here on this podcast. That was a lot of fun. Now, we could We could dive into that here, but on the mound, let's – I guess, shift to that intriguing series, Twins, Astros. Other than Braves, Phillies, I think it's the most intriguing series at the moment here. Um, who who do you think holds the, the pitching edge in what's now a, a best of three series? Well, wow. I mean, you know, it's the Braves and Phillies are the big Goliath matchup, right? I mean, uh, prime time. Uh, you kind of wish it was a seven game series that, you know, the format kind of robs us of, of what this series could be, but I still say the Phillies. I love Rob Thompson. I think he stole one in game one with his pitching decisions and, and the kind of the bullpenning that he did in that game. They were poised to win the game two as well on the road. Great comeback by the Braves just to make it more interesting, but I still like the way, where the, the way the Phillies are, are, are lined up both in their rotation and, and their bullpen as far, as far as that goes. Uh, we've said all along, Minnesota is the team to watch. Uh, Pablo Lopez has uh, had a great year. We saw what he did the other night. Um, the, the, the starting rotation of the Minnesota twins is built for postseason. So they, once again, they, they were kind of overlooked the whole way. And uh, the twins have what you need. You have that, that that starting pitcher that can win a game for you all by himself potentially, or at least put you in a position to score first and then to hold on. You know, the, going into the postseason, I said it before, is that the default setting should be it's the Astros championship until someone takes it away from them. Having said that, just from a pitching standpoint, you have it. You, Jack, you said it. You you've turned this into a best of three series, and you're going to have. Sonny Gray at home against Christian Javier. Javier, not as great as he's been as he was last year. And Gray is on a fantastic roll. And it's going to be a madhouse in Minnesota. And then, even though you're not quite sure about game four, I guess, what would it be, guys? Maybe like a Joe Ryan against Jose Urquidy. I don't think yeah. that's really a disadvantage uh, for Minnesota at the very least. And then if you get to a game five, it, yeah, you're going to be going back to Houston. It's probably going to be... Pablo Lopez and Justin Verlander, which uh, signed me up for that. But I think I think Minnesota has the pitching advantage. I don't know about the overall you know team outlook for the possible next three games, but just from a pitching standpoint, I think it's Minnesota. Unless Carlos Correa has like an S underneath his shirt, right? <laughs> Superman, <laughs> and he's got incentive to, against his former team. But he he is remarkable. I agree. I agree completely, Shaq. But I think Minnesota's underrated. You know their pitching staff. And it kind of goes back to the essence of what the playoffs have become. What we were talking about moments ago, an 87 win team here. You see what has happened in those games at target field. When they swept the blue Jays, people are energized that this series is coming back to target field tied at one. It's going to be very interesting. I would give the slight edge again in the pitching department to the twins. And I also think, man, we're probably like a blister uh, short of the Braves and Phillies being the premier 
matchup of just raw pitching in this postseason, I think it's this series. I think it's the Twins and the Astros with pure pedigree and talent at the moment, right? In this moment in time, I think both teams combined, they have the the best series in terms of just raw pitching between their starters going uh, going on, uh, having great seasons, the Houston pedigree, even though they're not having the best seasons, and both bullpens. Uh, both bullpens have... Uh, punched above their weight in certain spots and they just have some raw talent so this is this is really the series that i'm intrigued with uh the most i'm really excited for game three coming up uh, in minnesota how about the orioles and the rangers baltimore down 0-2 and i guess this is more of an offensive led question here do you have more faith in the young homegrown core with baltimore the rutschmans the the gunner hendersons ryan mountcastle jordan westberg or the Rangers, young homegrown core, have really risen over the last week. Evan Carter, who we look, we didn't know who Evan Carter was 10 days ago. Uh, Josh Young, Leody Tavares, whose young homegrown core do you have more faith in at the moment? Can we factor in Jackson Holiday, who's not even here yet? <laughs> you know, the, the Orioles have more on the way. So I, I think they probably, in terms of volume and what's coming next, get the edge here. But I'll say this Evan Carter looks like a keeper. You know, a guy can do it all. He can move around athletic, got a little bit of pop, hard to strike out so far. I mean, we haven't seen enough, but wow, first impressions are good. I'll, their third baseman is really good. Josh Young had a little bit of an injury there and missed some time. Uh, I still think he's going to get some rookie of the year votes. He's right up there. One of the best rookies we, we've seen. Plays good defense at third, and this guy's got some thunder in his bat. The other way, his pop the other way is real. This guy's going to be the third baseman for the Rangers for a long time. He's a good one. And uh, if you haven't if you haven't really paid attention to Josh Young playing third base for the Texas Rangers, you're missing out because the guy is the real deal. You know, Young caught a tough break in the middle of the year where he was catching a line drive and it broke his thumb, knocked him out for a little while. Evan Carter, fantastic and a real a real find for for the Rangers and, and credit to their front office. And now he's a top thirty prospect. He had some you know lost some deve- developmental. Uh, time both as an amateur and as a pro with the, the canceled minor league season 2020 and and all that and and now he's breaking out in the postseason having said that I think looking at the two teams and, and the young core for for both I think the best two players I think are Adley Rushman and Gunnar Henderson so because of that I am obligated to to lean Baltimore's way but that is in no way a knock on Texas they got something good going too Yeah, In this moment, in a vacuum here, give me the Rangers' young homegrown core. Again, at the moment, they need one win over the next three games. And they have star veterans in guys like Seager and Semyon, Adolis Garcia. They can lean on those veterans. Uh, The the Orioles' young homegrown core, while very talented, and I would pick them over the long haul, not just in this series. That's it right there. They only have themselves right now with their backs against the wall. So with one game to win over the next uh, possible three. Give me the Rangers young homegrown core at the moment. Um, all right. The division series are ongoing. Something that's not ongoing is the Blue Jays season. It's over. They were swept by the Twins. Probably one of the most disappointing teams in the majors that made the playoffs this season. Uh, Toronto manager John Schneider pulling Jose Barrios has been the second guess of October at the moment. GM Ross Atkins in their post-mortem, he said that the decision was solely Schneider's. Guys, how tough is it for a Blue Jays fan to believe Atkins when he says that's a manager's decision alone? Kind of a half-truth, right? (laughs) It's sort of, you know, just, just cover yeah, I you know that these things are scripted out beforehand and all the information is given to the manager before the game, hours before the game. Every scenario is gone over. Here's what you can do in the here's what you can do in that spot. I think the fact that this was more of a piggyback start kind of a situation, flipping from righty to lefty, it's more understandable. That move didn't cost them the game. What cost the Blue Jays the series in the game was their their offense and their their redundancy of right handed batting being kind of their pop. Does that sound familiar? Yankee fans, a little too right-handed. They tried to address that in the offseason. If you want to talk about one move that hurt the Blue Jays, it was the offseason trade. When you trade, when you traded for Dalton Varsho, who's a good, good young player and, and nice guy to have on your team to try to get more left-handed, but you gave up 
Gabriel Moreno, who's a great catcher, maybe the catcher of the future. He's had a great start. And also Lourdes Gurriel Jr. out there who came up with a big hit too as well. So that trade looks a little lopsided in terms of an overpay. And if you want to go back to one move that probably hurt the Blue Jays, it's probably that move in the offseason, not that pitching move uh, where they lost a game two to nothing. The these things are are mapped out, and I'm sure there are many people in these meetings going, okay, well, if this happens, then we do this. What if this happens? Okay, you map it all out. At the end of the day, though, John Schneider is the guy in the dugout, and he's the guy picking up the phone, and or you know, his staff, they're picking up the phone. They're getting Kikuchi warmed up in the bullpen. I thought it was a very good idea to have Kikuchi sort of warming up alongside Barrios for – an inning or two. I mean, I, I was, I was there in Minnesota and, and Kikuchi was up basically from jump street. And cause you're thinking, Hey, we're in an elimination game. It is all hands on deck. Barrios looked very good early, but if he puts two out of three or three out of four guys on base, this could get haywire in a hurry. So you want to have that little rip cord there just in case. Now I think it was a little bit too quick of a hook. And even uh, I think I would be considered the, uh, the the Mr. Sabermetrics guy, analytics guy, blah, blah. I think it was very roundly on all sides, the old schoolers, the new schoolers. I think it was very roundly um, uh, critiqued in the moment saying, hey, this is this might be a little too quick to pull Barrios here. That said, Coney, you're right, where it wasn't just you, they gave up two runs that day. And so as far as the Blue Jays pitching plan, it didn't go terribly. And it really is pinned on the offense and it wasn't just that they couldn't get a big hit in game one or game two. There was also, you know, Vlad Guerrero jr. A, a great play by Sonny Gray and Carlos Correa, but at the same time, where are you going Vladdy? That's, that's a, that's a big yeah. blunder in a spot where you have the tying runs on base. So that if you were, it is a mistake, but I think if you were to say, what were the biggest reasons why the blue Jays lost that series? I don't even know if the Barrios thing makes the top five. <laughs> All right, let me play devil's advocate with you two. So I agree. I think the Blue Jays took a step forward in defense and pitching. They took a step backward in offense in 2023. Uh, yes, they did not lose the series because of that one pitching move. Because They lost the series because they didn't score enough runs. But in that moment, that's where the two runs were created for the Twins. So in that moment, that's where that game was technically lost. And you have a Fair. pitcher in Kikuchi warming up out of the bullpen for a starting pitcher who amassed over 160 innings this season, doing that for the first time. And James, I'm hanging on something you said there with John Schneider's decision here. And I'm just wondering from both of you, you know, I'm going to defend again. They didn't, they didn't lose because of that pitching decision. Again, that was the moment where they did lose the game. Yeah. They didn't score any runs, but that was that moment. I, I'm wondering though, how often do you think managers around the league, not just, a punch in here on Toronto, but how often do you think skippers lack the conviction in some of their own decision making here because it may go against the information that they received before the game from the front office? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot that goes into it, including trying to flip the lineups. We we've seen that, you know, with with Gabe Kapler and Sandy in San Francisco the last four years, where first chance he gets, he'll flip the lineup and pinch it and try to get the platoon advantage in the middle of a game to put pressure on the other manager. And that's what Schneider was trying to do. He took a kind of a page out of Gabe Kapler's book and tried to catch his opponent in a flip from a right-handed starter and all of your right-handed lineup and all your lefty hitters to Kikuchi, a lefty right in the middle of the game and maybe force the other manager to manage, to maybe make some moves, use his pinch hitters earlier, whatever weapons you have on the bench to be able to kind of get that platoon advantage, which is still very important in my mind. I think there's very few players or pitchers who don't benefit from a platoon advantage. Um, they only the superstars really uh, that are somewhat immune to that, but yeah, you could see what he was doing to me. It had to be prearranged. You know, it's just a matter of when you're going to pull the ticket. And uh, the, the problem is it looks bad. You know, wait a minute, you're starting pitchers, your horse, why are you taking them out so early? Well, you're trying to trap the other manager. You're trying to manage. And sometimes managers can't help but manage, right. Instead of just sit on your hands and get out of the way and let the players play. You know, this was a kind of a preordained, a managerial move. I'm going to manage. I'm going to try to force the other manager's hand and make him manage as well and make moves uh, according to ready lefty situations. And and a lot of times that's great. Um, the Dodgers have definitely done that as well with, you know, they do that like hockey style line shift 
in the fifth inning or whatever over the last few years. And, and, and that's worked for them. But as far as the, you know, CYA sort of a managerial philosophy, it's you, you, a lot of times you'd see managers make moves because they don't want to be criticized for doing something unconventional. Well, now it's almost the reverse where you want to do the, the thing that might be considered unconventional in the old school mentality. But you, if you make that, if you don't make that move, John Schneider, I, I said, John Schneider, he's the one sitting in the dugout. If he trusts Jose Barrios that much, he can stick with him and, and more power to him. And I, and I love Jose Barrios. I hope, you know, I hope he has a great game. And, but if it doesn't work out, then it falls on you. Hey, you knew all these things about how Barrios does in the middle of games and how Kikuchi and lefties would match up against these guys, blah, 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 and you still didn't make the move. Now the hammer's going to come down on you. And I think that does play into it to an extent. But at the end of the day, these are all, we're all just trying to make marginal, uh, marginal gains here and there to try and win the moment in front of you. And Shaq, you were right where you say, okay, we could look at it from the big picture and say, hey, they held the Twins to two runs. But you're right in that, well, even though it was just the fourth inning, that was where the game was won. And it goes back to what you said earlier, right at the top, Coney, playoff baseball, it is high intensity from the word go. And the crowds are into it. And because everyone knows every two strike count, every a leadoff walk, this could be the moment, even if it is in the third or fourth inning. You know what else I think might help fans digest decisions like this too? Um and again, not just picking on the Blue Jays here, because I think it spreads through, to an extent, all 30 teams. You know, it didn't work. But you never hear, whether it's a front office member or the manager, say, hey, we made the wrong move. It was a mistake. We miscalculated. I took a shot, and we missed. You never hear any of that. I think something simple like that, I get it. You don't want to admit you're wrong. You want to defend your decision. I think that would go a long way. For your own fan base, I think it would it would help them and convince them and draw a stronger connection when you can just admit, hey, we took a shot and we missed. And unfortunately, that's the nature of a postseason sometimes. That's fair. All great points. And, you know, this is what kind of where the rubber meets the road between old and new school. There are a lot of analysts high up the ladder in several major league front offices that believe in this style of pitching, that you should just have a bunch of three inning pitchers. You know, that no defined roles, man, unless you have a real stud like a Garrett Cole or a Logan Webb, somebody like that, who's an innings eater, that's your 200 inning guy. Uh, it, you know, but the vast majority of games should be run like that. Piggyback starts, you know, what we saw with Johnny Brito this year and the Yankees come in in the middle innings, give you three innings once through the line, maybe twice. And that's it. And you're going to have a collection of three inning pitchers. And that's the battle that's going on in front offices right now in terms of, Roster construction, pitching staff construction, how we put this thing together, how we're going to run it, especially if we don't have bona fide starters. If we're caught in between sort of these middling starters or guys that aren't established as rotation members yet, this is an alternative pitching strategy of just once through the lineup, three inning type pitchers, but let's, let's get them together. And that's what they're training in the minor leagues. You know, there's, there's not a lot of guys in the minor leagues that are going seven innings in, in their game started. There's a lot of four inning games started in the minor leagues nowadays, especially when you're trying to protect them in terms of workload as well. Well, the other thing too, is and this is something where fans and, and, and media and everyone needs to, to get on board with too, is that, Hey, it goes the other way too. It, sometimes you, you leave the guy in and he gives it up. Sometimes you take him out and it works beautifully. So you look at Rob Thompson and the Phillies in game one, Hey, Ranger Suarez, he, he zipped through three innings and change and he looked great. Boom. Rob Thompson pulls the cord and he starts the parade and it went perfectly. Great game one win. And now, even though Zach Wheeler was great in game two, and I had no problem with leaving him in to, to face Darno and, and, and those guys in the seventh inning, but that game went from four, nothing. He's pitching a no hitter to four, three really quick. And that kind of, and that does put a pin in the hole. Well, you can't do anything with this guy because he's cruising. Every pitcher is cruising. till they're not. Sometimes you leave him in and it goes great and he strikes out the side and you're cruising to a 4-1 win. Sometimes they kick the door in and the Braves get themselves back into the game with a big home run. So sometimes you're damned if you do and damned if you don't. 
A great, great discussion here. I really enjoy it. Uh, intriguing division series continue. Uh, but let's focus in on the Yankees. David brought up the magic word moments ago, talking about Johnny Brito. It's the uh, it's a buzz word, buzz name for a, a lot of our fan base here on Toe in the Slab. The Yankees, they've been pretty quiet since last Sunday in Kansas City. A lot of teams having their post-mortem, postseason press conferences. We have not heard anything from the Yankees just yet. And I want to bring in Dan Rourke here because I'm interested to hear about his idea when I pose this question to you, fellas. So if you had a seat at the table during these meetings that we keep hearing about at the Yankees complex in Tampa, if you had a seat, what are you hammering the table most for? in 2024 david we'll start with you but we want to bring in dan rourke as well so david james and then dan take it away well what i'm what i'm hammering the table for mostly is outfielders you know and we've seen it a lot of drafts and a lot of organizations like to draft middle infielders shortstops how many times have you seen a shortstop be a top signing because they're the most athletic position on the field if you have a really good shortstop you can move them around the field he can play second he can play third you know, uh, case in point is uh, Oswald Peraza, right? Great shortstop. He can move to third. He can play second. But the problem is, is that you're short on outfielders. The Yankees got caught short on the outfield situation. And the fact that Estevan Florial was left in the minor leagues all year long, even though he was exposed to waivers in spring training, nobody claimed him. But he was your guy that you probably should have been up sooner, at least to find out, try to develop more outfielders. Where are all the outfielders? If, I, if I'm the if I'm a Yankees fan, I'm speaking kind of as a fan now, obviously, um, you know, you, you got to put an emphasis on that. And I know there's guys in the pipeline that are coming, whether it's Spencer Jones or somebody like that, you know, but they're short on outfielders right now. And that needs to be addressed in the offseason. We need a center fielder now. Jason Dominguez was a nice was a nice uh, show there for a week or two until he he got hurt. Uh, but even with him, you're going to need outfielders. You need a left fielder. Now you need a center fielder and a left fielder both to start next year. What do you do about it? Who do you sign? Uh, do you take a chance on a Bellinger or not? I think that's really where this centers around. The pitching staff's in pretty good shape because of Michael King at the end of the year doing so well. Uh, to me, it's all about outfield. You know, where are the outfielders? I'm glad Coney's got the outfield covered because I'm going to go in a totally different direction. The, the market in the outfield is a little short. I mean, the, the time to, to make big splashes on the offense were the last few years where you could have brought in a Bryce Harper or a Corey Seager or a Freddie Freeman and on and on and on. Now, maybe Cody Bellinger's that guy. If you want to take a big swing, maybe Kevin Kiermeyer on a shorter deal. Is, if you want to take a smaller swing, that that's good. I say, Sign Yoshinobu Yamamoto as the best free agent starting pitcher for 2024. And I know the pitching is in good shape, but we know how quickly five starters can become three, can become two, can become one. And I just think that because there is a lack of a big, big impact bat for the outfield or, or elsewhere going into this season, I say a penny saved is a penny earned. A run saved is a run earned. And if you can, make a the biggest splash you can and it just happens to be a pitcher i'd go with the best guy available yeah i mean i, I agree with both of those i think for sure there'll be a couple big splashes one being yamamoto the other maybe being bellinger i would hope for soda but i know that's not necessarily realistic so two obvious splashes bellinger and yamamoto the other guy i would look at because i think the Yankees are certainly going to make a trade with the Cardinals. A lot of people have mentioned whether that's Dylan Carlson. They had connections with them uh, last year about him. I would take a look at Brendan Donovan. Now, he's only been in the league for a couple of years now, so he has about five years of control left. So it, it would cost you know a little bit. I think you could offer perhaps Clark Schmidt for him along with, I don't know, Johnny Brito, Randy Vasquez, because the Cardinals need pitching. They have a surplus of left-handed hitting. So whether it's Donovan or Carlson, whoever it may be, I think a trade definitely goes down uh, with the Cardinals this winter. But Donovan in particular, man, mostly because I believe Glaber Torres will get moved this offseason with just one year left and set to make over $15 million in arbitration. You essentially could swap one year of Glaber, not a direct trade, but just Glaber out, Donovan in, five years of control for what would honestly be probably your first true late leadoff hitter since, I guess, prime DJ when he was doing well. But five years of Brendan Donovan, who... Since the start of his career, 2022 has a 124 WRC plus. And when you compare that to Glaber, who this past year in one of his better years in recent memory had a 123 WRC plus. So he's right around the same uh, 
value offensively, but does so from the left side. He has the 12th highest OBP in baseball, actually, since the start of his career. And you'd have him for five years. It'd cost a little bit, like I said, probably Clark Schmidt and then a couple other pitchers maybe on top of that. But I think if you make two big splashes in Bellinger, Yamamoto, get the fan re- fans reinvested, season ticket sales, get those back up. But also, the Yankees need to get left-handed hitting, and not just for the sake of getting left-handed hitting, good left-handed hitting. And Donovan's, in my opinion, one of those guys that's available. I've, over the last few days of doing research on him, I've fell in love pretty damn quick. He's a move that I think almost has to happen because we kind of lack a leadoff hitter right now. I mean, if we don't go out and get him, are we running it back with DJ, who had a good second half, OPS over 800? I still believe in him, but I think we we definitely do got to shake, th- shake things up a little bit. And going out and getting Donovan, not just for this year, but to, to have him for the next five seasons. Same you could say with Yamamoto. I mean, it's not just about 2024, but even if it doesn't all work out next year, I mean, Yamamoto is only 25. Uh, Donovan's only 26. So these guys, when things do finally, let's say, click, if not next year, in a few years, they'll still be right in the prime of his career, um, of their career. So I would say my little off-season blueprint, if you will, Bellinger or Soto, if you can. But Bellinger, Yamamoto, Donovan. And then I also, in addition to that, would also like to take a flyer. Uh, no, I shouldn't say a flyer because, you know, he had a good year. But Kevin Kiermaier does interest me especially as, you know, he'd be the Yankees center fielder until Jason comes back. He bats from the left side as well. Of course, the defense is good. He's still pretty quick. And uh, in a way, a lot of people, when I bring that up, will say, oh, he's just another Harrison Bader. Well, of course, the main difference being that he hits from the left side, but also he hits lefties as well. I mean, you look at the splits, they're not too far off. I believe his average against lefties this past year was right around 280, 260 against righties. So I feel like him on a, on a cheap one-year deal, in addition to the other moves I just mentioned, that would switch things up a little bit. So that would be the, the off season that gets me the, the most excited. See fans, this is why Dan Rourke has such a, a pivotal seat at this theoretical boardroom because he covered what baseball operations, scouting, finance, and business operations as well, talking about how it could put more fans in the seats uh, in 2024. So very nicely done, Dan Rourke. Very nicely done. Thank you. Um I'm gonna I'm gonna keep names out of it. It's just a a strategy for me if I'm sitting at this table when I'm hammering home guys try our hardest to leave no doubt we went into last season with sizable question marks over third base and left field and I appreciate you having blind faith in a bounce back season from Josh Donaldson but I think in the back of our minds we were probably overthinking it a little bit we didn't want to be honest with ourselves we rolled the dice there we came up short it didn't work out and left it didn't work out at third base Bottom line, this is the peak of Aaron Judge and Garrett Cole's prime. Do not leave anything open to chance in left field, third base, and now center field as well. Just one more item on the to-do list. Bottom line, get the personnel that makes total sense where you do not have to say, well, if XYZ plays out this way, we should be good. To me, there is no room for that. After 2023, you have to leave no doubt to the best of your capability and not hope that a questionable player who is inserted into a starting position can pan out in 2024. And that happened twice in 2023, and they were burned both times. For sure. And one more thing I'll say on the topic of uh, of going all in, just I know I'll sound very cliche fan here, but. We do have to spend, and the tier of $277 million scares me a little bit. I think we got to go over that once more, and the pushback I'll get when saying that is, I guess if you go over 277 your draft pick gets pushed back 10 slots, but if we're worrying about a 2024 draft pick, I mean, when's that guy come into play to even see the benefits of that when Judge and Cole are 35 years old? So that's a very big thing is, yo, like we got to go in when the window is kind of reestablished that window, which never should have really closed of Judge and Cole, two of the best players of baseball in their prime. Let's go all in. And one thing I just want to say as well, on topic of that, I, I really do want to dream about Juan Soto, which, you know, I'm not so sure he'll, he'll get moved because the Padres still have one year left of control. They could say, oh, this was, you know, a mishap, aberration. Let's go back all in on 2024. But I do believe the Yankees have the farm system to potentially overpay and go out and get them. Because if you want to get them, you're going to have to overpay. It's not just going to take proper value. You kind of have to wow them. I would put together a package, to be honest with you, even though it's just one year, I would consider maybe a Spencer Jones in that deal or Drew Thorpe, who just won minor league pitcher of the year. And, you know, maybe some guys on top of that, Peraza or Everson Pereira. 
it it gives me PTSD that, and this is a free agency issue, but like seeing Bryce Harper and him excel in the postseason and all these other guys Yankees could have had, or maybe even if it's Corey Seager. And I know now you can go out and get Soto next year, but then what? That's another year past judging Cole's prime. So you can, if you can go out and get Juan Soto this year, if it's possible, I know there's a chance it's not, but like don't miss that opportunity if it is. Guys, I think we eliminated like a day or two of board meetings at, at Steinbrenner <laughs> Field. So um, hopefully hopefully someone's listening and uh, and, and you take some of our, our terrific ideas here, guys. Um, Division Series is going to keep playing out. Um, championship Series will be established in short order by the time we are ready to record for our next episode. James, David, I hope you are having a terrific start to your respective summer vacations. Um, what what do you guys do in between these playoff games to to kick off your leisure time? Anything? Working on my handicap, you know, trying to get back into the, the golf swing of things. There we you know? go. It's it's, it's 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 what we do. Ex ex ball players, you know, we like to hit hit balls, you know. So the only thing that the left is, it's not like there's a seniors league for baseball. It's not like I'm calling up Ron Darling, going, "Hey, you want to go play? Want to go play a pickup game in Central Park? Let you get your team together." It's not happening with ex baseball players. We we go play golf or. Some guys play tennis, lifetime sports. Baseball is not a lifetime sport. It's a lifetime sport for fans, but it's not a lifetime sport for, for players. I, I can assure you of that. I, I just got to go try and fix my fantasy football teams. <laughs> Short and to the point. Very nice. Uh, guys, appreciate you listening here for this episode. And uh, James, David, had a terrific discussion here. Appreciate you both. That is going to do it here for this episode. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel so you're not left out and miss anything that we are streaming each and every week. For David Cohn, for James Smythe, our terrific producer, Dan Work, I'm Justin Shackle. We will talk to you next week on Tone with the Slab, Pitching with David Cohn, a production of John Boy Media. Enjoy the Division Series, everybody.